we'll start off here, Kier. I want to know something about your business. You know, like when did when did you start it? Uh, you know, this it is a monthly subscription business, right? Mm-hmm. Well, the, you know, I have two. I have two. I have the rug, rugby strength coach. I would say has been going since formally to 2010. So it, it started out of a necessity, which is poverty, <laughs> because I was I was interning at a pro club at the time, and um, it was 40 hours a week unpaid. Um, living in London, expensive place, and I'd been involved in training for a long time, and it, it got to the point that the amateur team that I was working in had a lot of people kind of asking me for programming advice and stuff like that. So I thought, well, you know, I need money, so I'll. I kind of go in that direction <clears throat> and you know i as my career moved forward i just got more and more credibility and you know perceived authority when it came to rugby so i decided to just specialize in that <clears throat> and sort of niche in terms of because you know they say niches niches mean riches so it's like on online business in particular i think is like starting a fire with a magnifying glass so if it's always moving around you're never going to get the the kind of focus and heat that allows you to start a fire so i really niched down into the the rugby world and saw a gap there so i decided to put out um information products and services and online coaching for rugby players and that that had kind of grown and then basically about five years ago i came to the realization that there's there's some inherent problems with that particular model of, of business and one of those things is that um, unlike America, if, if you are going to go into the pro rugby system within the UK or Australia, New Zealand, the, the clubs are going to get their claws into you from a very, very early age. So maybe as young as 12, not as bad as soccer, which could be as young as four in the Premier League. But at the age of 12, you're going to be getting it for free. So, you know, if, if you're really, really good, you're going to get it for free. If you're an adult and you know you suck and you're just an enthusiastic amateur, you don't care. So you don't necessarily have an emotional uh, need or want for, for training. So that kind of narrows it down to you have guys that are just on the cusp of maybe a semi-pro status. You have super enthusiastic amateurs. And then basically you have kids with pushy parents that want the best for their kids. And um, another problem with that is it's, it's a seasonal business. So if, even if you speak to people that have private facilities and specialize in certain sports, there's a real kind of like variable uh, degree of contact. So when it's off season, pre-season, you see them a bunch, then they go to school, they disappear. And in terms of, you know, business model, it can be quite difficult to sustain. So coupled with the fact that as my standing in the field kind of grew a little bit, I realized that I was getting a lot of followers and interactions that weren't from rugby. So I decided to put together Strength Coach Network to, to get around that. So Strength Coach Network is more of a, a coach education uh, platform um, because it's not seasonal. There's a lot of competition. There's a lot of desire and motivation to um, get ahead compared to the competition. And it's basically what I wanted for myself when I was coming up that didn't exist. So kind of two tracks to the business. Um, but you know, strength coach network is probably the one that that's the big one. Time. It, re- revenue time. Yeah. What is the, uh, what is the cost pri- or the cost point price point? 20, 24 99. Uh, if you want to go monthly, if you want to go annual, it's uh two forty nine ninety nine. And you know, right now we have over, I think it's 300 hours of video education. We have, you know, over 700 members so this is like guys at the very top nba nfl head guys all the way down to like entry-level coaches so one of the big things that we try to like emphasize is if it is who you know that gets you ahead we're going to be the place where people come to make those connections and introductions and if and when that opportunity does appear in terms of interview prep how to apply for a job all that kind of stuff our, our kind of motto is when you go up for a job interview, there's, you know, dozens of us behind you helping you, whereas the other people are going in with just their own experiences. So that's, that's how we try and look after our members. You know, that's interesting because it was not ever uh, our intention, but mm. we have found that people who sign up for TFC feel like they belong to something. Yeah. They really don't, but they feel like they belong to something. And, 
And I, I think Chris and I have talked about it. I think it's because of the outgoing giving nature of me and Chris. And we try to find people who are like us that are very giving and they answer questions and they're available. And uh, I think it's really powerful. Well, you know, there's two things I think you've done where I don't know if it was a conscious decision or it's just happened organically, but there's two, like, one is you have a great identity. So you, you're you very clear about the, the kind of mindset that you want your customers and your associates to have. And then, you know, I always think the best way to market it or an easy way to market is to have an enemy. And everyone knows what your enemy is. You know, it's very, very easy to position against something as opposed to for something. So you combine those two things together and it's, it's very uh, useful to have that community around it because that, I think that's one of the things that online businesses struggle with the most is typically they're going to come for the content, but then they're going to stay for the community. So yeah. CrossFit, CrossFit has been successful, not because of the quality of the training it's because you've got a room full of, you know, <laughs> uh, maniacs that are going to put a lot of peer pressure on you. If you leave, that's why it's so successful. I like that. Now, getting into, um, before we started talking about training and stuff, you yeah. go all over the world. Yeah. What, what's your favorite place? I kind of say it, it varies where, what it is you're trying to get out of the, the experience. So, I, you know, people say, do you miss Japan? And I say, I miss the money. <laughs> it was, it, it paid very well. It was like being on a different planet. It was very, very new, um, but I just kind of found that the the work culture of Japan is not very compatible with my style and what I like to do, which is, you know, a rigid adherence to tradition over going against the grain. They don't like people that put their hand up and point out if something's dumb, you know, just stuff like that. So it, that did not gel well with me, but it was a, it was a hell of an experience. In terms of like the the interpersonal style and the the community, Argentina was untouchable you know I, I could i could whenever i went to a different town because i was all over the country it would be you know i'd get the call from one of the players what are you doing tomorrow you're going to come and have lunch with my family at my home you know all this kind of stuff i could pick out their family members uh, the food was good there too unreal unreal food yeah i mean certainly what i like to eat like i don't like fish i like meat so argentina over japan easy and then i think lifestyle australia because i was living Eastern suburbs, so I, I could be at work at five o'clock and literally be on Bondi Beach at five thirty. So that's not bad. Not bad. Not bad. Not bad at all. No. I think America. I, I like the most. I love America. Well, America means a lot of different things. I mean, like you know, Virginia is a lot different than you're in Virginia now, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, you know, I it's a lot different than California. You know. Oh yeah. Well, I went to Texas a couple of weeks ago, and it's, it's a very very different place. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So um, one last thing about forming connections and stuff. I love your TFC story about how you met Eric. Yeah. Well, you know, he, he doesn't remember it. So, but we, we met once before. And I, I always kind of tease him about this. Like we, we actually met once before in 2015. So we, we met at the Boston Sports Medicine Performance Group seminar in 2015. So I flew in to meet Jay DeMeo and we'd, we'd gone to, uh, to some event and I, I very briefly met him when he was at Kentucky. And, um, but yeah, where, where we met, met, he actually knew who I was, was at TFC. Uh, was it two or three years ago? Two years ago. Yeah. Was it? Yeah, two years ago. So yeah, we're in Chicago and I, I bumped into him in the elevator and I, you know, I said hello. And I kind of mentioned that we'd met before and he was like, but anyway, yeah, we, we, we connected there. And um, yeah, it basically led to me getting hired at, at William & Mary. So I'm very, very grateful for the opportunity to have, uh, have presented for you guys. Yeah, I, lo I love those stories. The, um, I mean, we could talk all day about this probably, but you were kind of a stranger to American football. Yeah. And here, here you, it's almost like, what's that, that new show, Ted Lasso, where the American football coach goes to England to be a... a <laughs> To be a football coach in England, yeah, and he doesn't know jack shit about coaching soccer. So, yeah. um, um, anyway, tell me, tell me what you think about of, American of, football. I mean, there are people that would say that I don't know jack shit about football now. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I've got uh, I've got some associates in in the college game. 
you know, that, that I, I know their position coaches read my tweets and they, they send me rants about what does this guy know? Literally give us back our sport, blah, 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 blah. But, you know, what I've, what I've tried to do is, is approach the problem with, with fresh eyes and try and be logical about um, what it is we do and question everything. Why, 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 why? And, you know, that was basically the crux of the presentation I did last summer on the tribe test. Um, you know, you, you come in and see the game's five seconds on, 35 seconds off, and you do that six times and you do this for 10 minutes. Why are we doing a test that requires you to run all out for 60 seconds, rest for five minutes and do it again? So I come into the sport and I'm like, well, why are we doing this? Oh, well, we've always done it like that. Well, why? And then that's, that's when you start to get them, well, you don't know football or you're just a rugby guy. That's why I changed my Twitter bio to just a rugby guy because that's what the fans of William & Mary had said about me. <laughs> so, you know, I love football. I, I really love, um, like I said, I love American culture. I love the enthusiasm of the guys. I love the fact that kind of similar to rugby, it's a game for everyone. There's, there's, there's a huge variety in, in body types and skill sets and the demands and stuff like that. And in some ways, it's a simple game to understand. And in other ways, it's very, very complex. And that kind of like intellectual challenge is what I really, really enjoyed. So, you know, in 2017, 18, I was getting a little bit bored with rugby just because it was the same thing. Whenever you go to a new club, it tends to be the same things again and again, because there's, there's like a multi-year process to establishing yourself. And I thought, you know, time for a change. And that's when I started in football. What are the, from a fresh set of eyes, and I love that you said that because um, I have um, this week spoken to three top 10 NCAA head coaches of lacrosse mm -hmm. who are very interesting, are very interested in my mm -hmm. ideas. Yeah. Uh, and I am somebody who's never watched an entire lacrosse game, never played it, never coached it. Yeah. But I spoke for the uh, on a lacrosse clinic mm -hmm. and it was things that maybe if you're in the middle of it, you don't realize that you're just repeating all the mistakes you've always done. So I'm interested in that, but what are the biggest mistakes in your opinion, with a fresh set of eyes that S and C football people make in America? Just live in medium. <laughs> medium works in clothing. So it doesn't work in training. If, if you have, especially where speed is concerned. If you have a game that requires you to exhibit maximal acceleration or maximal velocity on a repeat basis, the idea that you're gonna develop those essential qualities with medium intensity training is simply untrue. So if you are getting results doing that, you probably have crappy athletes with no training age. Once you get outside of the first year or two of training, it's just a fact that to increase the envelope of those qualities, you're going to have to train with an extremely high level of intensity. You're going to have to rest a long period of time. And you're going to have to be quite judicial with the, with the volume that you expose your athletes to because uh, intensity and quality and uh, volume are that they're, they're kind of like diametrically opposed. And, it, you know, in football, it's kind of like Japanese rugby more, you know, if someone's good, more is better. If it hurts, it must be working. If they're, if they're doing two, we're going to do four. And I think as Bob Alejo said, you can train hard, you can train long, but you can't do both. And like Eric had said, um, I think it was on Twitter the other day, that basically you, you get this first week syndrome in, in, uh, in the season where the head coach comes on the, the, the radio and says, we look out of shape. And you and I have talked before, it's because you spent the entire summer training in a manner that looks nothing like the event that you're preparing for yep. so football players are not dumb if you flog them six days a week and you train for three hours at a clip they know what's coming they're going to lower their intensity to survive or they're going to go hard and they're going to get injured right. so they, they they subconsciously train themselves to get really really good at sustaining sub-maximal outputs and repeating them for hours on end which is cool if the game looks like that and it looks nothing like that because, you know, you, you're going to be on the field. If you, if you do a three and out, you're going to be on the field for two minutes. That's it. And then you get a long rest and then you have to go super hard again. So I'll pick on FSU. FSU said in week, 
what was I think it was the second game of the ACC uh, conference that they were cramping. Are you telling me that a group of athletes that trained in the heat of summer in Florida somehow struggled with dehydration in October? No, they, they cramped because neurologically they were not prepared for a task. Uh, well, they, they'd been training in a matter that did not prepare them neurologically for the task of the game. Right. Which yeah, I, I, I love that. And, and, and it goes back to what Bill Bowerman said a long, long time ago, coaching track is that world records never come from moderate exercise. No. So, so he was like the first guy that said that we have to have like a wave-like action. It wasn't Chip Kelly. It, it was like, we have to pick days to perform and practice because if we're expecting extreme results, we don't get that by centrist activities. Mm -mm. And that's what I see just over and over and over again in almost all team sports. Yeah, that is your, your kind of essentialism. You, you mentioned essentialism and I went and read it. The first chapter was written for William and Mary. Training, how the department was run, everything. And I, I, you know, I wrote down to myself and I was like, how would I do my job if I was a consultant? And it wouldn't look like this. And I made every single member of my staff read it. And the same is true in training. Your, the model that you've done with the Feed the Cats, People can say, oh, you know, this doesn't make sense. This doesn't make sense. This doesn't make sense. Well, okay, why are they running so fast? And I think a reason for that is because of the focus, you're not making a millimeter of progress in the, you know, a million directions. You're putting all of your eggs into that one basket and pushing massively in another direction. And the great thing about VMAX is, is that the, the rising tide that raises all boats. So it doesn't matter if you're not training the other stuff necessarily, especially with young athletes. If you push up that VMAX, everything is going to come up with it. Essentialism, essentialism probably played a part in your presentation uh, when you're talking about the postcard. Yes. That, yeah. I, I love that because, you know, the, the non-essentialist can't put it on a postcard, right? Yeah. It, it, it could be, I think, a useful exercise. This is actually one thing that we asked, we asked uh, applicants during interviews. Uh, to work with us is we, we ask them really, really difficult questions to force them to reveal what their priorities are. So we would say, for example, you have 15 minutes a day to train your athletes to make them the elite of their sport. What are you going to do? And the second they start talking about barbell exercises, they get a big cross next to their name. <laughs> the answer should be sport practice. And then if we say, okay, sport practice is taking care of you as a strength coach, have 15 minutes. What are you going to do? Once they start talking about speed, maybe change of direction, movement efficiency, then we start to talk. So I think whenever you put yourself in an environment where there's all these different moving pieces, especially like with me, what I've always been good at is looking at the big picture. Right. And it, you can get that analysis paralysis. What about this? What about this? What about this? What about this? So to, to distill everything down to a simple question and put constraints on yourself is actually liberating because you, you find out very quickly what it's all about. So that kind of, it, can you write it down on a postcard? If you can't, your thought process is not clear enough. So I always try to do that, you know, what, what's the postcard definition of conditioning for field-based sports? What's the postcard definition of power and, and things like that? And just having that kind of like super simplified mindset is like a good filter to pass all those questions that you ask yourself through. Yeah, I love that. The, uh, um, I, I forgot what I was gonna say next. Um, so about the tribe test. Yeah. You're famous for the tribe test. I should have put my name in it. <laughs> I got all these people being like, oh yeah, we're doing the William and Mary test. We're doing this, we're doing that. But yeah, I'm, I don't have the ego just to, to put my name in the test. <laughs> yeah. So basically the tribe test is, is a 20 yard sprint, a change of direction. You measure how far you can go in six seconds. Five. Five we, seconds. We, we simplified it, you know. <laughs> I think it's like 5.6 is like the tip. So we, we use, there's not a lot of data actually available for American football. So we used a paper that looked at the top 25 teams, balanced offense, in play, out of play. And it works out to about six seconds on, 36 seconds off. Uh, but we wanted to simplify it. The coach had indicated to us that he wanted to play up tempo. So we said, right, you know, snap the ball every 30 seconds, five seconds in play, 25 out of play. And the average number of plays in a, in a typical game is six. 
uh, but we pushed it up to 12 just to give them, you know, give them a little bit of what they want in terms of how much it hurts. We said, you know, worst case scenario, goal line to goal line drive, we're going to do 12. So we, it's a six minute test. Um, but, you know, when we first told it to guys, they, they'd come up in this 110 half gasser, 300 yard test. And they said, oh, you know, we've been doing 300s super hard. You're telling me we only have to run for uh, a minute. It's a minute of total running over six minutes. I said, yeah, that's it. They said, oh, this is going to be easy. And the first time we ran that test, there were bodies everywhere because it, they realized it wasn't a test that they could submaximally pace. Because what happens with the 300 is, I'll, I'll give you a time, you know, 56 seconds. And if I'm going 51, 52, 53, and you know you're going to make it, you're going to cruise. But when you, when you measure to the yard what guys are doing, every rep is going to be maximal. And that's, you know, another advantage is when you, when you measure by the, you know, to the yard, every rep, you actually get feedback about if you've improved and how much. So I say like a, a conditioning test with a pass fail is like having an IQ test that you're either dumb or you're smart. I think too, it adds a competitive nature to the conditioning that is not there in a 300 shuttle. Or oh yeah. Where if, if I was running it at my age, I would try to get as far as I could. Yeah, and we, we run them side by side for that reason as well. It's not just to share cones. We, we try and uh, get in the heads. Of okay, we've got a question here from Brad Dixon. Yeah. Uh, love your stuff, Coach. Um, my question for you, what are some of the task-specific football drills, practice period, that you think challenge your guys to execute better under pressure? So all... All technical skills, if, if we just look at it from, you know, a, a, a motor skill development perspective, all you're trying to do with the different skills that you see exhibited on the field of play, they are basically tools that you're using to solve a movement-based problem, which goes back to the, the presentation I put together for you guys. Generally speaking, in attack, you're trying to create uncontested scoring opportunities because it's much easier to just walk through the end zone you know, unguarded as it is to like kick in the front door or try and cut and evade some. So tactically, you're trying to use a combination of force, speed, or misdirection to create an uncontested scoring opportunities. So in attack, you get that by creating space. Space gives you time. Time means you're much less likely to make poor decisions and execute them poorly. Because if, if, if I gave you an hour, I said, right, stand over there and think about the best way to score. You're going to get it right. So you're trying to create space in attack, and you're trying to shut down space in defense and ultimately dispossess the other team of the ball because it's really, really hard to score points when you don't have the ball. So everything that you see requires the athlete to use those uh, movement skills in a creative fashion to achieve that outcome. And they're going to have to run through that OODA loop that we talked about, I think, in the presentation, which it takes it from Colonel John Boyd. It's, it's a military model. But the idea goes that in order to be effective in contests, you have to be able to orient, uh, observe your environment. So that's taking information to orient yourself. That is to derive meaning from that information, to select an appropriate response, and then execute it quickly. And all things being equal, although they never are, if you go through that loop faster than the other guy, that person is constructing a model of reality in their head that does not exist anymore. If I go to my right and cut to my left, and you still think I'm cutting to my right, you just, you're, you're now working with a model of reality that doesn't reflect what is going on, and that's where I'm going to get that separation. So in, in unconstrained environments, this is basically what you know, a former colleague of mine, Tom Farrow, would call chaos. So it's you know, just unconstrained practice, all you're concerned with is achieve a successful outcome via any means. And you're going you're gonna to inject your own flavor, style, preferences into that. It may be informed by who's in front of you, how you've been coached, all these different things, officiating, time in the field, position in the field. These are all inputs that will affect um, what you do and how well you do it. If you go all the other way to the end of the spectrum, we, we basically have skill. So it's skill, drill, chaos. The skill aspect is looking at what's in that movement toolbox. So if you only have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. If I find myself in a chaos situation that re 
requires me, for example, to uh, shift the ball in my hands, cut off my right foot, run a curve off my left hand side, and then open up into top end speed. Those would be the component tools that I have to use to achieve that outcome. If I don't first learn them in the skill, you know, progression, if I haven't ingrained those habits, I'm not going to be able to get into the correct positions that I need to one, be efficient and effective, and two, be uh, lowering my energy cost to increase sustainability of efforts, and three, put myself in safe joint positions, which is going to keep me healthy. You know, I've not earned the right to do that in a chaotic fashion. So there has to be a period in, in skill development where you, you actually place more constraints on athletes to force them into the kind of behavior that you want to see because repetition is the mother of skill. It's like dragging a sledge through the snow. You want to make those tracks deeper and deeper and deeper so that every time you go back, you're more likely to take the same path. Now, obviously, to go from that to unconstrained practice, that, you know, when, when you're learning skills in a low-pressure environment, um, it's very predictable. You know what the athlete's going to do. You know what the outcome's going to be. It's not very realistic. But to jump from one to the other is just, it's like going from 135 to 500 in squat. You have to progress in the logical manner. So drills, this is one thing that I think combat sports do really, really well. They say drillers make killers. If you look at wrestling class, if you look at uh, striking, not so much in jujitsu, they need to learn from it. But typically what you're going to do is you're going to take uh, a portion of that, of that chaos, maybe a scenario, and you're going to start to execute um, those movement-based skills and start to perform them in a reactive fashion. So now the attention has gone from internal only to external, but maybe more diluted. So rather than trying to look at a full 11 plays in front of me, maybe I'm just looking at like O-line versus D-line. And we know, we know what movement we want to see, but now it's a little bit more reactive. We have to observe, orient, decide, act. And then we're getting that repetition in. So we're starting to make it a little bit more realistic. And then obviously you take that and progress it. So in football, the, the skills are really quite simple. You just look at, watch film and think, right, what is every variation of every skill that I'm going to see? Draw a list out and make sure you hit them and make sure that you're being clever in how you design your 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 skill practice to ingrain those good movements. When you get to the chaos, that's when you start to look at like situational stuff. So for example, uh, goal line, first down, second down, third down, uh, third down, uh, kickoff, kickoff return, all those kind of things. And then when you get to the drill, that's maybe where you start to look at um, chunks of the game. So maybe, you know, throwing to a single receiver or a single receiver with a single cornerback, or you're looking at like a 1v1 O-line versus D-line or a 1v2, things like that. Very good. That was a long answer. Did I answer that question? Oh, you, you did fine. Cool. <laughs> uh, uh, it's interesting. I stole this from you and it's become a, a major part of, of how's your boy doing right now? Hey. Sonny, come here. Come here. <laughs> Sorry, ask the question. <laughs> oh, come here. Come here. <laughs> well, there he is. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> Don't ask me why he's got this one. Okay. Um, yeah. That's funny. Um, I, I stole this from you. Uh, the uh, Art of War stuff by, uh, by Sun Tzu. Um, did I pronounce it right? Is it Sun Tzu? Art of War? Oh, Sun Tzu. Sun Tzu. Okay. Sun Tzu. Yeah. The, uh, where, you know, the, you win wars by speed, power, and misdirection. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really interesting to me that you focused on the misdirection part. Yeah. And you probably know what I focused on. Speed. The speed stuff. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah. It's, it's funny. So, so what I've used with it is that every football coach is really good at the complexities of misdirection. I agree. I mean, they, they have like a notebook next to their nightstand. And yeah. they wake up, even if they, they may not even sleep, and they're writing stuff down, you know, for, for ways to trick or, you know. But, they, you know, their guys don't have the speed to capitalize on it once it exists. Yep. So, yeah. And then I would give strength coaches at the, in football an A+, mm -hmm. because, because the weight room is, in every football program, the yeah. weight room is, we'll just be nice and say it's emphasized. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like, 
there, there's nobody that says, ah, we skip weights. Now they yeah. all do a great job in the weight room, but I'm always pissed that so many coaches love speed, mm-hmm. boot speed, worship speed. Don't train it. And they do nothing about it. <laughs> yeah. It's not true. Really? No, no, I'm saying they don't train it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, good. I, I thought you said some football coaches don't like it. So, uh, so it, it's weird. I, I think I'm right on that, that, that speed is a very neglected skill. But yeah. explain to everybody why you chose to focus on misdirection. Well, here's, here's the thing. If, if you look at how a lot of qualities tend to be distributed, most, well, no, some qualities exist in a curve of, of normal distribution. So if you look, for example, like height, the tallest person on earth is probably going to be like a maximum, say, four times taller than the shortest person on earth. So there's an inherent limit to how much better you can be. And speed is absolutely normally distributed. So for example, how much faster is Usain Bolt compared to a decent field sport athlete? Let's say 25 to 30%. Right. So there's, there's, a, there's a limit to how trainable it is and how much better you can be. And to an extent, you know, you, you can recruit your way out of that problem um, if, if you have the money or if you have just great numbers. So, you know, there, there are, I've heard of like almost double figure guys hitting 23 miles an hour in an SEC game uh, on GPS, which in pads is, you know, no mean feat. And some of the training you see in the SEC is garbage. So I think the statement that you can recruit your way out of that problem a little bit is true. But the fact is, is that the misdirection is not normally distributed. So when you have a non-normally distributed variable, it makes sense to invest your time and effort on something that offers potentially a far greater return on that investment. This is not to say that one thing is better than the other, but uh, once, once you've mastered speed, and it, you know, there's only so much time you can spend training speed in a week productively. The rest of the time has to go in misdirection. And I think, you know, I, I wrote on Twitter the other day, it's actually quite instructive that if you think about um, the Allied landing at Normandy, as attritional as that was, as force oriented as that assault was, they still relied on misdirection to send Nazi troops to Scandinavia and misinformation campaigns. So even, even that kind of stuff relied on, on misdirection. And, and, it worked, and it worked as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, here's the thing. Split is forcing. Yeah, speed. Speed has a, a, a misdirective uh, value in itself. So if, if you look at the, the, the problem of speed to solve is, hey, guess what? That fast guy over there is going to get the ball. And if we don't stop him soon, he's going to be in space and he's going to score. So what teams do is they end up double teaming that guy or rushing or blitzing to try and, you know, stop him guess what? You just made space some, somewhere else. So the, the value of the speed comes from the misdirection that it creates or the misdirection that it capitalizes. And I always say, and when I'm arguing the speed part of the three things that win wars is that if you have better team speed than your yeah. opponent, yeah. your misdirection will be better than their misdirection. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So yeah, it's just, it's just interesting to talk about. Um, love to talk about mental toughness, and yeah, I know that you doesn't exist. <laughs> huh? it doesn't exist. <laughs> well, you know, in, in the in the uh, it doesn't exist how most people think it exists. Right. Yeah, like like for example, um, I think many coaches make the mistake of believing that extreme fatigue mm-hmm. and pain in general creates mental toughness. You know, it goes all the way back to the Spartans beating their young boys near death, and sometimes death. Yeah. In order to create tougher warriors. And, yeah. and we are still kind of doing that in mm-hmm. bad programs. Yeah, so that's just, Dar- you know, it's just Darwinism. It's, it's not, you're, you're revealing who can tolerate pain, not developing who can tolerate pain. Um, so, you know, to steal from James Smith, he, he would say that, two people that you can learn from. One is Socrates. So the the beginning of wisdom lies in the definition of terms. David Deutsch would say that a good definition is hard to vary. So if you look at like the best definitions that we have available, 
is math and physics. What speed? Distance divided by time. Can that be argued or varied? Absolutely not. It's, it's, it's a law. So conversely, a bad definition is going to be one that can be highly varied or uh, disputed. So you say, right, what's mental toughness? And they'll say, well, this is mental toughness. I'll give an example, right? Johnny Hendricks fought in uh, the UFC, was an NCAA champion wrestler, uh, was a professional MMA fighter. Is he tough? And everyone will be like, yeah, that guy's super tough. So, right, Johnny Hendricks, the MMA fighter, failed three fights in a row to control his diet so that he came in grossly overweight and got docked 30% of his purse. Is the ability to stick to a diet rigidly, despite how hungry you are, uh, associated with mental toughness? And they'd be like, yeah. So they're right, Johnny Hendricks is simultaneously super mentally tough and super mentally weak. Is it the case that both of those are true? No. So really what we're talking about is multiple uh, different qualities that we've grouped under the umbrella of mental toughness. So what we have to do is kind of follow that uh, Socrates maxim and be really specific about defining what it is we mean when we say mental toughness. And then what we have to do is just distill it down again and again and again until it can't be argued anymore. And ultimately what we're going to come up with, we're going to have a bunch of different qualities. So maybe it's going to be pain tolerance, which is part of it, but then also, for example, uh, communication, task focus, in, you know, information processing, or ability to like block out emotional control, um, aggressiveness. These are all different qualities. And once you define something, what you have to do is then go out and try and measure it in a, in a meaningful, valid, reliable way. Because you, if, if you're going to train something, you want to know, hey, it works. It, it would be, if we use speed as an example, we can define speed, we can measure it in a valid and reliable manner. If, you, if you're not uh, measuring, you're guessing. Same, same thing with mental toughness. So if we, where, where possible, we want to define it, measure it, and then we're going to look at the, the conditions that most elicit or exhibit that quality and then you're going to try and dilute it down again and again and again and again and again and that's where you're going to start with your training you're going to expose people to that and then just like physical training push people to their you know the edge of their ability stop they'll get a little bit better and you just keep pushing and pushing and pushing and tony over there who's babysitting one thing that he said to to me when we were working together at william Barry, he said any uh, situation that doesn't kill you as a human being with sufficient repetition becomes desensitizing. So what we have to do if we're sport coaches is say, you know, what are that, you know, those myriad mental qualities that elite athletes possess in abundance? How do we measure them if we can? What are the scenarios that best exhibit those qualities? And how can we, uh, create training scenarios of sufficiently low intensity that athletes are going to be robust to those demands and then how do we progress them over time and keep pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing so that eventually we do get the kind of you know bleed on the training field laugh on the battlefield but the idea that you know exposing somebody to a ton of pain in preseason is going to prepare them to be on a big stage quickly process information take instruction and execute quickly, not be intimidated by somebody trying to, you know, uh, to pass rush and, and break their knee in half. It's not going to be the case. You, you have to think, you have to work backwards from the demands that you're preparing them for. Yep. Reverse engineer it. Yeah. And, and the, uh, and I really see toughness as the ability to perform. Absolutely. It's just the ability to perform your task. And I remember Jim Harbaugh, a guy, you know, like, my favorite football team in America is whoever's playing Michigan. Because <laughs> I just don't like Jim Harbaugh. And um, he said one time, football is the last place in our world right now where we teach boys to be tough. And, and somebody posted right under his tweet a picture of the Big Ten cross-country finals. And it was like snowing sideways. Mm -hmm. And every single guy had little shorts on and tank tops. Yeah. And they said, these guys are tough too. Everyone's sport is different. <laughs> Everyone's sport is special. You could, you could take the toughest guy on Michigan's football team 
mm-hmm. and tell him to go out and run five miles hard in the mm-hmm. snow and mud, and he would not seem tough. You know, I, I went to, uh, when I first got to Richmond, I went to an MMA gym to do some kickboxing. Look at that. I went to this kickboxing gym, and uh, there was a, a pro fighter there. And he asked my, what my background was, and I told him what I did for a living. And he's like, man, those rugby guys are really, really tough. And I'm like, you get kicked in the face for a living. It was just that disconnect of, like, he, d- he doesn't want to go out and play rugby in front of 8,000 people the same way that an international rugby player doesn't want to go into a cage and get kicked in the face. And there was a, a golf coach that I spoke to, William and Mary. He played around with a Navy SEAL. It got to the green, and this Navy SEAL said to the coach, he said, I don't know how you keep your car on the green. <laughs> and it's, it's because you, you have to be inoculated. It's stress inoculation. You, you have to be business as usual under the most intense pressure. And just the... Uh, for us with Argentina rugby, the Southern, you know, Argentina just beat the All Blacks, best team in sports, at like a 95% win rate ever. Beat them two weeks ago. And they've been in the Southern Hemisphere Championship since 2012. I started with them in 2013, and we lost 17 in a row in that tournament. We were 0 17 over three years, and we won on the 18th. The year after that, we won against South Africa away, and then we reached the semi final of the World Cup. And this year they beat the All Blacks. And what it was, we had to get used to the environment. And we were at the World Cup and what we played the All Blacks, we're winning after 65 minutes, we ultimately lost the game. We were winning with 15 minutes to go. And one of the guys said to me in the locker room afterwards, he goes, hey, we're getting there. And it, it's just that, it was like Andy Murray in tennis. Andy Murray had to get used to losing, to win. <laughs> it makes sense. Explosion. Um, um, kind of a change in subjects here. What the yeah. hell happened at William and Mary? So, Eric, you know what Eric's all about, right? Yeah. yeah. What Eric had been told it was his job to do, and what Eric had recruited our staff on what it was we were to do, when the time came to pay the necessary political cost with executing that game plan the people that had to pay it were unwilling to do so. And we could have chosen to stay in that environment and collect a check and, um, you know, ultimately compromise on values and we chose not to. So we decided that the, the time had come. So, you know, of the six staff that we had assembled, there's one left. Yeah, it was like an all-star s and staff. And, and- we, you know, I'm, I'm biased, but especially with the weight room, that shit, you know, we, we used to have recruits come around the weight room and I used to tell recruits straight out, I said, listen, you're going to go to a lot of schools where the weight room is a lot nicer than what we have right now. And ultimately it's smoke and mirrors. That's the sizzle that sells the steak. And I said, if you can go into any other FCS weight room and find a guy that was a, a head of sports science, the NFL, I'm okay. I did 10 years in rugby. We had Scott who won a, sorry, he played in national championship final at FCS college football player, very smart guy, played the game, understands the game. Good luck. And so who in the hell replaced the entire staff? Couldn't tell you. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, that was, that was another issue, you know, for me, is that when the COVID stuff happened <clears throat> and we, you know, when we, when we went back and it started to be like, you know, this staff is, is not going to be intact, there was no effort to replace those individuals due to cost cutting so the the cost cutting combined with the the covid restrictions and who can be in the weight room and when i'm not exaggerating at all when i was on the floor 14 hours a day <laughs> and you know i live i live an hour away i was like 16 hours a day door to door and uh you know doing that six days a week and it, it's one thing to do those hours when you feel like, wow, we're at the cutting edge for us in terms of what we're doing, feel like the school's supporting us, feel like we're, we're getting a lot of like self-determinism in terms of the work. And that, that ceased to be the case. And obviously, you know, my son coming back and stuff like that, oh, I'm not going to sacrifice his upbringing to be, you know, spend 14 hours a day being a glorified personal trainer because if you, if you want me to sacrifice on that, you're going to have to pay me a lot more. And it, it's going to have to be much higher quality work than this. And I'm, I'm sure, you know, the other guys thought the same. 
Um, and what's Eric Corum? What's his direction? So he is heading up a sports science company of his, his own making, which is doing some very, very exciting stuff in terms of harnessing user data to individualize training and uh, lifestyle design. So it's, it's called AIM7 and uh, watch the space. I've actually invested in it myself. <laughs> yeah. Where, where do you see yourself 10 years from now? Um, you know, a lot of people have, have asked me because I was so vocal about when I came to the States, Part, partly to put pressure on myself because I made a big, you know, like Cortez, burn the boots. I, I did that verbally. I said, I'm going to work in the NFL to put pressure on myself, no going back to rugby because, you know, they were paying me 14 grand a year at Richmond and I entered into it willingly because I had money saved up. I could have gone back to Europe and, you know, easy six figures in rugby. But I said, no, I'm not doing it anymore. Like, this is what I want to do. And now that I've made the decision to leave, <clears throat> a lot of people have been like, well, what's going to happen to the NFL? And I've realized, like, I, I don't necessarily want to deal with the same problems in a nicer office. Yes. And I, I, can, I can handle problems. I can handle, you know, tough schedules and stuff like that. But it really is, you know, speaking to Andy Ryland at USA Football, he, he mentioned to me, he spoke to a college football coach that said that his biggest regret was allowing his wife to raise their children. And when you're a single parent, even worse. So I just decided, you know, if it, if it is going to happen, it's going to be on my terms. And it, it's going to have to be a very, very right move because, you know, I, uh, I think it was Mike Rodango, we did a podcast and he put a clip and said, I evaluate every job through the um, the pay the personal life the career progression and the sense of purpose and what i said to the school was you know i, I can go out and make money on my own and i've been doing it uh the personal life my personal life is not better for having worked here uh in terms of the career progression I, it, it may be a little bit arrogant but i said if anyone's going to get me to the nfl it's going to be me i've demonstrated now that i can do this job you know college football and we almost kind of hit a ceiling of like what is it we can achieve with the the leeway that we've been given by the school, the budget, like all this kind of stuff. This, this is not a knock on the, the football coach at all. Like London it was a dream to work with, and I really love this stuff. It's kind of like a level above that. And then the sense of purpose, it's like when you're doing 14 hours a day and it's get them in, get them out, same program, admittedly due to COVID. I think, nothing. if I remember right, I first knew of you, you emailed me. Mm -hmm. about five years ago from japan yeah you're asking about hamstring injuries yeah and maybe activation because yeah. you read something i'd written about activation and it seems like from what i know of you you reach out to people uh more than anybody i know i, I try you know if I'm, I'm not gonna uh i'm not gonna try and solve the problem by myself if somebody's already come to the uh the solution yeah, like, like, not only do you have your podcasts and everything, but you are constantly trying to read bizarre shit <laughs> yeah. and, and take stuff from, I mean, um, what, what got you like that? Have you always been that way? I think, you know, I've always grown up pretty, like, curious. Um, you know, my, my mother likes to tell a story about me when I was three years old. I was like, where do we come from? And she's like, oh, you know, when a man and a woman love each other very, very much and blah, 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 blah. She went all through that. I said, no, no, where do we come from? And she's like, what do you mean? It's like, where does the world come from? Where do people come from? And all this kind of stuff. And she's like, oh, okay. So she like laid out the kind of like, well, some people believe in God. And I know you're a fellow atheist. And she said, some people think that it just came out of nothing. And she's like, what do you prefer? And I was like, oh, I think it came out of nothing. But, you know, at the age of three, I was like trying to figure out like, where it came from and I, I have maybe quite like a an analytical mind and I like to like dig into stuff and find out I used to have a series of books when I was a kid that called, that called how things work and um, yeah I think it's just that's why you know I'm not working in college football anymore but I'm still learning about training every day because I'm just like intellectually curious um, but I can't tell you where it comes from uh, uh, share some books I mean our, our people are constantly uh, want to know what books people are reading? What, what books would you suggest to people? 
Well, I mean, since since I've left, I've read a bunch of books. So I've read um, The Almanac of Naval Ravikant, which has been, you know, I, I read it and it was, it was simultaneously a confirmation of decisions that I'd recently made. And then it got me thinking about the future and, you know, other stuff. Um, what else did I read? I read, let me think, I finished a book called um, Beat the System by Howard Marks. That was more to do with finance. I'm reading a book right now called The Complementary Nature, which is like intense. It's, uh, it's all about coordination dynamics and uh, dynamic systems and how they interact, which is it, pretty interesting because, you know, if you, if you look in nature, there's complementary pairs of everything everywhere. So like within sprinting, uh, stride frequency and stride length would be a complementary pair. And it's, it's never one nor the other. You have to like combine the two. And if you look at um, like wave particle duality, right? right? You know how electrons orbit uh, a nucleus. They don't rise up suddenly, they jump, right? That would be an example of like uh, a dynamical system suddenly like there's a change. Humans are the same. That, you know, you don't suddenly go from a walk to a run. It just, so you don't like gradually go from a walk to a run, it just happens. So that's been, you know, it's got the cogs turning in my head. Um, the Book of Why by Judea Pearl, which is, you know, I've, I've been rephrasing this question to everyone that I speak to, and it was like a, a bomb when it went off in my head when I read it, which is, you've heard the argument that correlation is not causation, right? right. So, what is causation? <laughs> and I got to 35 and I was like, I don't know, what is, what is causation? So, it, it forced me to think about how do I know what I know and why? Because one thing that you realize about sport is that all knowledge is just a reference to previous experience. And then you're making predictions about, well, based on the amount of times that this happened in the past, I think this is gonna happen in the future and I'm gonna make, I'm gonna take a course of action based upon that. In sport, the errors arise from failing to see a pattern that is there or seeing a pattern that isn't and then making a subsequently bad decision and that is basically i'm sorry to pick on them football coaches oh that team over there with the guy waving a towel over his head seems to win a lot of championships next week everyone is going to wave a towel over their head or you're out that's an example of seeing a pattern that doesn't exist so if you if you can understand how we know what we know and detect errors where there may be some that gives you a framework to speak to sport coaches and say, how, if you know something, something to be true, how do you know it and why do you know it? Which is, exactly. it's pretty heavy. It's pretty heavy. I always, um, I'm one of the few coaches that speak against process because yeah. coaches are always saying, trust the process, trust the process. But there's so much in the process that is 100% bullshit. Yeah. That we just repeat. <laughs> because that's what we saw some good team do, or that's what we were used to seeing. And the process needs to be questioned all the time. It's that Jeff, Jeff Bezos says, put yourself out of business. It's, it's better you put yourself out of business than somebody else. And you know, it used to drive me up the wall. For three years I heard, well, the All Blacks don't do this. Are you saying the All Blacks are wrong? Yes, I am. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Um, I, you quote Buddy Morris a lot. Yeah. What, what do you love about Buddy? Never stops learning. If, if, if anyone has earned the right to sit on their laurels and say, this is what I do, this is who I am, I'm not going to change, as Buddy Morris. You know, he is 30 plus years into the game. And, you know, I've been reading his stuff for, say, 15 years. And you look at the stuff that he was doing 15 years ago, he was like, he was the West Side guy. And I had a coffee with him a month ago. And so he goes, oh, you know, I don't really squat my skillies. We don't, you know, we don't go above 70% in season. You know, we're concentrating on sprints. We're concentrating on this and on that. And you can see the evolution um, in his thinking. And he doesn't have to do that, but he's chosen to do that, I think, because he, he is intellectually curious. And I, I heard about a dinner that he went to. It was him, Carlo Bizzicelli, uh, Brian Mann and somebody else and Buddy Morris turned up to dinner with a notepad and I just, I just love that and he, he's just a super nice guy.
what uh, now that we're talking about characters out there um uh, uh give me a couple people that would fit in well as as terrific speakers at tfc uh nick the marco nick is you know there, there's an abundance of riches in the ca there's some there's some real good people in the ca you know nick mike tucker villanova uh zach higginbottom the former atlantic um, and you put me on the spot if you wanted to go international tom farrow has just finished with uh, england sevens um do, do you want some combat sport guys or you want I, we once had a synchronized swimmer. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah. So we, we have an open mind. Uh, William Wayland. William Wayland trains a, a number of uh, high-level combat. He, he actually, it's like a weird like triple threat. He trains professionals in MMA, motorsport, and golf. That's like his three babies. And he also runs a private facility. Just a, a super... Uh, you know, he, he's, he's my height. He's 245 with an almost 500 pound front squat. And he's one of the most intellectual people I know. He has a, he has a private Instagram account where he goes, talks about architecture and travel and all this kind of stuff. But his, uh, you know, I love his thought process. Where's he based? He's based in Chelmsford in Essex. Okay. Yeah. That's England, right? It is. Yeah. You're going to have to put your hand in your pocket for that one. <laughs> yes. Uh <laughs> The, uh, how do you keep from getting information overload? I mean, if as much as you study, yeah. well, I'm sure that, uh, you know, the people who, who try to watch all 20 of our presentations and listen to all 20 of our podcasts, especially the younger coaches, mm. they might just be just totally confused. That's okay. It's you, you know, I think in, early in your career, you get really, really good by saying yes to everything. It's essentialism. It goes back, you know, you, you, you expose yourself to learning opportunities and you develop by saying yes to everything. But eventually it becomes about depth, not breadth. So you, in later in your career, you, you get better by saying no to almost everything. So there, there's certain, you, you need to consider where you are in your career and what's going to help you the most right now. And, you know, I'll give you an example just in the business stuff. In the last year, I've taken no online coaching class whatsoever because it's too much of a distraction and I need to put my efforts into stuff that is, you know, non-scalable, which is the memberships. So that, it, it, you know, in, in the short term, it cost me several thousand dollars a year, but I know in the long term it's going to pay off. So I think that's one thing to consider. And then, again, it's just like little heuristics or rules to live by. When I first got a head of academy job, I think I was turning 27 at London Wasps. And I was like, oh my God, you know, this is, a, this is a massive challenge and I need to worry about this, 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 this. I'm thinking, you know, I have to be the best coach in the world. And in, in reality, to, to get retained and to build up political capital, you just need to be better than the other guy. That's all you need to do. You need to be better than the other guy. And if you can, you know, compounding interest, I think it is a, a 0.1% improvement every single day, repeated for 10 years outstrips 100% improvement once per year after three years. So you're going to be way ahead after 10 years if you just keep that compounding interest. This is Naval Ravikant. He says the most powerful force in the universe is compounding interest. So I just ask myself, what is one thing that I can do today that's going to move me closer to where I want to be? And if I just come back and do that for 10 years, eventually I'm going to be good. That's great. It, right. it, it's been 10 years now, so I hope I am. How old are you now? I'm 35, so I've, I've been, I started in pro rugby as an intern at 25, which is kind of late, but. What, how did you feel about what you saw in rugby compared to college football? Is, is rugby way behind or way ahead? Every, every culture in every country has stuff that they do well. And, you know, my first mentor, Ian Taplin, still talk to him today, it, he said, your biggest strength will be your biggest weakness. So, you know, he, that, he said what, that to me. What is your biggest strength? My biggest strength is that I put people at ease by being funny and flippant. And if, if taken to the extreme, I, you know, I don't let it happen. But, uh, well, now I don't let it happen because I have the seniority to back it up. But when you're an intern, 
it can lead athletes into thinking that you're a doormat. So there's that. You know, again, I speak to Eric about it. I'm quite open with Eric about my sports, which is my ability to see the big picture and all the moving pieces means that I don't care about the detail. And I don't. <laughs> he's, he's, you know, he's, he's pretty good at voice, but he's very, very detail-oriented. And that's why we, we complemented one, so, one another so well. Um, so what the individual countries and what the individual sports do really, really well. In Australia, if you called a coach sir in Australia, they would laugh you out the room. And there's a, there's a lot of bad stuff that goes with that because it, when, when you want the athlete to be an active stakeholder in their own performance and development, calling somebody sir is a hierarchical relationship and it's not a two-way street. So whenever I met a recruit or an athlete and they called me sir, I'd be like, no. You can call me Kier, you can call me the rugby guy, but you don't call me coach or sir. You know, ultimately my job is to serve. It doesn't mean that I'm not, you know, there's not going to be a working relationship and I'm going to enforce standards upon you. But, I, you know, if there's something wrong, if you, if you feel like you're going to get hurt, if you don't like an exercise for a real reason, if you want to do something different in your training and you've earned the right to have that opinion, I want to hear it. That's one thing that's bad about college football. But in America, the, the level of competitiveness... Huh? Once again, can, can you get another one out of the fridge? Oh, so at the uh, the couple can left. Hey, Tony, go eat there. Tony, go. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, what American football does really, really well is is the energy, enthusiasm, resources, competition. Um, you, you're never you're going to have to really tell an American football athlete, like, oh, you know, it's time to dig in and work hard. And it's their biggest weakness because that's all they lean on. <laughs> um, you know, in, in uh, Europe, Australia, very, very good um, athlete monitoring, data-orientated uh, programs. Uh, in America, you know, everything is cured by uh, iron and sweat. So you have coaches there that, a spreadsheet is what you start a picnic with and in Australia you've got guys that sit behind a laptop and don't lift weights so it's it, it's that pendulum swing you know you, you need everything but you can't be too much of one thing and do you speak fluent Japanese oh, absolutely not no <laughs> I, I speak um fluent Spanish from the Argentina days you know it was I think just because they're both European languages a lot easier to uh to learn uh, never, never had a lesson. Really lucky that all the boys spoke English, but you know, culturally, for me, I tried to take it upon myself to learn Spanish, and they said I was the first foreign coach to actually attempt it. And um, yeah, with the Japanese, it's just it's so difficult. I spent two years there. They paid for lessons every single week, and it's still very, very hard. Now, were you aware that uh, that until the COVID thing hit, that Chris Corpus was prepared to? Uh, be the speed coach for um, England ro rugby. Yeah, I remember we uh, we talked about it at dinner, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, um, what would have been his? Uh, I mean, I'm sure there have been a lot of things that he wasn't expecting that would have hit him. What 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 would have he had found strange about about being with a professional rugby team? I mean, I, I know members of that stuff. You know, Tom Thompson has been with them six years, seven years. And he's just an awesome guy. You know, he, uh, he, had a, he had a tough run at the 2015 World Cup that we both went to. He was at a World Cup final last year. And, you know, he still paid money to go and hear me speak when I was in London two years ago. So he's absolutely not above learning, even though he's got probably the biggest drop in English room. Right. Um, Eddie Jones is a character. Um, he, he, quite frankly, I've heard he's a fucking lunatic. Good and, good and bad. You know, when he was at Saracens, apparently people used to have a competition, which is how late or early can you send Eddie a message and he'll still be up working and responding to it. And it got to like, send him a fax at 4am and you would get a reply at 4.02. Um, so he's very, very intense. Uh, it produces results, but it comes at a price. So I think if you were to look at uh, prior to making the World Cup final with England, um, he 
had a run with Japan where they beat South Africa in the 2015 World Cup, which was probably the biggest upset in world rugby ever. They made a movie out of it in Japan, I believe. And I was in Japan a year after. And you hear about how they prepare for that World Cup. They were doing three sessions a day, six days a week, and they were in camp for six months. <laughs> and you look at like the physical and mental toll that it takes on players. A World, a world Cup is going to exert a physical, exact a physical toll on players. But I worked with a national team captain, and he was just cooked the year after. And you know, that's it's one of those relationships. Like I've talked about him. Uh, numerous times where it's like because of his mentality and because he's he's half Fijian, half uh, Kiwi uh, foreigner, but he's he's basically been in Japan since, since the age of 15, so he's very much in that Asian culture. He was trying to work his way out of it, and I basically said to him, I was like, Lichi, you're basically drowning and you're trying to solve that problem by pouring a glass of water in your face. So that may be one of the things that you have to you know, sail with the wind a little bit in that, in that culture, um, despite the effort, the, the results that it produces. Uh, in terms of the rugby culture, I think it's like rug, rugby guys, they, they love to work. It's kind of like football a little bit. They love to work. Um, sometimes they can be a little bit impatient. So you just have to like, uh, you have to get them to believe in what you're doing and give you a little bit of faith to be like, you can sit down for three minutes and rest. Like I tell people, that the most uncomfortable feeling you're ever going to feel as a strength coach is you're going to feel the eyes of the school coach burning a hole in the side of your head when you've just run 40 yards and you say, all right, go sit down under that tree for five minutes. <laughs> I, I can't imagine that. I, after, I, I think, well, I've been a head coach every year of my life, except for, well, not my life. Uh, my first year I was not a head coach, but I've been yeah. a head coach for 39 straight years. And yeah. I, I have never felt those eyes burning into my head and I don't, I'm not a very good assistant and I can't imagine being an S and C coach because they're almost every head coach is a character. They are, but it's, you know, I think it, it, it's kind of like a, a, a two way thing. One is you have to be, you have to be careful about the head coaches that you pick to work with if, if you have that luxury. And then the second is you have to be mindful of uh, setting out your stool and being real upfront about what it is that you want to do and what you expect and stuff like that. Because I sometimes wonder if strength coaches uh, make, make a bed for themselves that they don't like lying in, down the road. So, you know, it's always like the career thing of if you want to hitch your wagon to a head coach and you get the pay rise and you get to walk into a department when that head coach gets a job, if you're going to ride it on the way up, you have to ride it on the way down as well. Yeah, and that can, be, that can be true in how you, how you go about your business. If the coach says, well, I want to do this, well, I want to do this, I want to do this, and you, you, you placate that coach, you've started on that road towards basically, especially when they pay your salary, of being judged more on how well-liked you are and how well you give the coach what they want as opposed to dictating the terms up front. Here's the criteria that we agree that you're going to judge me on, and I'm going to try and achieve those the best I can without consideration of the, the route that we take together interesting the uh, uh, let's end it with uh, one last question let me see if I can come up with a great one explain two things that Buddy Morris talked to oh no no the most the, the I want to go to the most controversial thing that you brought up in your entire presentation and that is that slow receivers are better than fast receivers in football I didn't say that. What I said was, <laughs> you said slow guys were the all pros. <laughs> well, no, no, no. Sorry. Here's the thing. If I'm five foot five and I want to play as a shooting guard in the NBA, am I going to make it? No. no. If I'm six five, can I make it? Yes. Yeah. If I'm seven five, am I going to be the Hall of Fame? No, because there you there, go. there's, there's a there's a barrier to entry that you must clear in order to earn the right for other qualities to be- To punch your ticket to the next it, level. Yeah, it buys your ticket to the dance, you still have to dance. So if you, if you look at the, the, you know, this is why I think you have to be careful about the speed at all costs approach, which I'm sure you, you would agree, is if you have a guy that runs four or five, 
he can he can make the Hall of Fame. If he runs if he runs five flat, he's not going to make the Hall of Fame. But once you kind of get in the ballpark, if you're kind of around that middle for the level that you want to play at, and obviously the numbers get harder the higher you go, if, if you're in the ballpark, the truth is it's probably going to be uh, in this order, execution of uh, technical and tactical ability under intense psychological stress, tactical ability, technical ability, and then physical qualities that make the nice. difference. Yeah. Nice. So if and that's the thing that the reason why I brought that up is, is because I have had people actually use that as an argument against speed. That's bullshit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that look, the fastest guys, they never make the best players. And I'm like, are you arguing that you want slow? Well, I'm just saying that speed's bullshit, you know, and, and, and so I think one of the key things to look at, if you look at the size of those guys, let's say the top 10, 40 times of all times, mm -hmm. uh, they're all small. Yeah. They're all small. I yeah. mean, the, the, the super fast guy that I coached was 5'6", 149. Yeah. And, and, you know, he might make the NFL, but mm -hmm. right now he's only played, I think, one play for Purdue mm -hmm. this year. Mm -hmm. so, um, so it is a mixture of speed and size and tactical and all that stuff. But, it, but there is definitely um, guys that are a step slow sometimes don't get drafted. That were well, really absolutely. And the thing is, is the, the less well-rounded you are, the less you've cleared those barriers to entry, the more of a master you have to be in one particular area. So if, if you are a step slow, you're going to have to be an absolute master of the, the tactical, technical realm or, you know, insanely psychologically tough. Whereas if, if the adaptation is there on the table, take it. And then you can be a more well-rounded and, and it goes back to, you know, I'll talk about rugby because you know, that's just what I know. The, the same is true in football. If someone, you know, a player once said to me, he said, when you play South Africa, you know what's coming. If they're going to kick in the front door, they're going to try and run down you and that's it. it. He said it hurts, but you know what's coming. He said, when you play Australia, they're going to try and throw the ball around and, and run around you because that's how they play. He said, but when they, when you play the All Blacks, he said, all they're going to do for the first 20 to 40 minutes is decide what it is you're going to try and do. And then they're going to spend the next 20 minutes picking you apart. And then they're going to spend the last 20 minutes murdering you because they have that ability to change their approach. And it's not just a, a one-sided um, development that they're leading. And the, the same is true. If, if you can be, and you should try, lightning fast, super um, technically efficient, super tactically gifted and mentally robust, that should be the goal. Right. No doubt. I just want to clear that up. Don't Make worry. Sure We're on the same page. <laughs> same page here. Yeah. It's been great talking to you. Take care of Anderson. Um, do you mean? Is it nap time yet? We, we've had nap time. It's going to be uh, dinner time in like an hour. Well, I guess you are, Ali. There you go. Yeah. Well, enjoy the rest of your evening and thank you so much. It's your third time at TFC, right? I think it is. Yeah, yeah. Ah, fantastic. Great talking to you. Good luck and don't be a stranger. All right. Hopefully we'll do this in person next year.